Good morning, friends. We're starting a new book today, The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Chapter 1. The 100th Birthday Party. I jumped out of bed that morning with one question in my mind. Sun or fog? Usually it was fog in January in Holland, dank, chill, and gray. But occasionally, on a rare and magic day, a, win a white winter sun broke through. I leaned as far as I could through from the single window in my bedroom. It was always hard to see the sky from Beji. Blank, blank brick walls looked back at me. The backs of other ancient buildings in this crowded center of old Harlem. But up there where my neck craned to see, above the crazy roofs and crooked chimneys, was a square of pale pearl sky. It was going to be a sunny day for the party. I attempted a little waltz as I took my new dress from the tipsy old wardrobe against the wall. Father's bedroom was directly under mine, and at seventy-seven he slept soundly. That was one advantage to growing old, I thought, as I worked my arms into the sleeves and surveyed the effect in the mirror on the wardrobe door. Although some Dutch women in 1937 were wearing their skirts knee-length, mine was still a cautious three inches above my shoes. You're not growing younger yourself, I reminded my reflection. Maybe it was the new dress that made me look more critically at myself than usual, Forty-five years old, unmarried, waistline, long since vanished. My sister Betsy, though seven years older than I, still had that slender grace that made people turn and look after her in the street. Heaven knows it wasn't her clothes. Our little watch shop had never made much money. But when Betsy put on a dress, something wonderful happened to it. On me, until Betsy caught up with them. Hem sagged, stockings tore, and collars twisted. But today, I thought, standing back from the mirror as far as I could in the small room, the effect of dark maroon was very smart. Far below me, down in the street, the doorbell rang. Callers. Before seven, before seven in the morning, I opened my bedroom door and plunged down the steep, twisting stairway. These stairs were an afterthought in this curious old house. Actually, it was two houses. The one in the front was a typical tiny old Harlem structure, three stories high, two rooms deep, and only one room wide. At some unknown point in its long history, its rear wall had been knocked through to join it with the even thinner, steeper house in back of it, which had only three rooms, one on top of the other, and this narrow corkscrew staircase squeezed between the two. Quick as I was, Betsy was at the door ahead of me. An enormous spray of flowers filled the doorway. As Betsy looked at them, a small delivery boy appeared. Nice day for the party, miss, he said, trying to peer past the flowers as though coffee and cake might already be set out. He would be coming to the party later, as indeed it seemed would all of Harlem. Betsy and I searched the bouquet for the card. Pickwick, we shouted together. Pickwick was an enor enormously wealthy customer who not only bought the very finest watches, but often came upstairs to the family part of the house above the shop. His real name was Herman Slurring. Pickwick was the name Betsy and I used between ourselves because he looked so incredibly like the illustrator's drawing in our copy of Dickens. Herman Slurring was without doubt the ugliest man in Harlem, short, immensely fat, head bald as a Holland cheese, he was so wall-eyed that you were never quite sure whether he was looking at you or someone else, and as kind and generous as he was fearsome to look at. The flowers had come to the side door, the door the family used, opening into a tiny alleyway, and Betsy and I carried them from the little shop, little hall into the shop. First was the workroom, where watches and clocks were repaired. There was the high bench over which Father had been for so many hours doing the delicate, painstaking work that was known as the finest in Holland. And there in the center of the room was my bench, and next to mine, Hans, the apprentices, and against the wall, old Christoffels. Beyond the workroom was the customer's part of the shop, with its glass case full of watches. All the wall clocks were striking seven as Betsy and I carried the flowers in and walked, looked for the most artistic spot to put them. Ever since childhood, I had loved to step into this room, where a hundred ticking voices welcomed me. It was still dark inside because the shutters had not been drawn back from the windows on the street. I unlocked the street door and stepped out into Bartle Jorastrat. The other shops up and down the narrow the other shops up and down the narrow street were shuttered and silent. The opticians next door, the dress shop, the bakers, wheels furriers across the street. Furriers? Wheels furriers across the street. I folded back our shutters and stood for a minute, admiring the window display that Betsy and I had at last agreed upon. This window was always a great source of debate between us. 
wanted to display as much of our stock as could be squeezed onto the shelf, and Betsy maintaining that two or three beautiful watches, with perhaps a piece of silk or satin swirled beneath, was more elegant and more inviting. But this time the window satisfied us both. It held a collection of clocks and pocket watches, all at least a hundred years old, borrowed for the occasion from friends and antique dealers all over the city. For today was the shop's one hundredth birthday. It was on this day, in January 1837, that father's father had placed in this window a sign, Ten Boom Watches. For the last ten minutes, with a heavenly disregard for the precisions of passing time, the church bells of Harlem had been pealing out seven, and now, half a block away in the town square, the great bell of St. Bavos solemnly donged seven times. I lingered in the street to count them, though it was cold in the January dawn. Of course, everyone in Harlem had radios now, but I could remember when the life of the city had run on St. Bavo time, and only trainmen and others who needed to know the exact hour had come here to read the astronomical clock. Father would take the train to Amsterdam each week to bring back the time from the Naval Observatory. It was a source of pride to him that the astronomical clock was never more than two seconds off in the seven days. There it stood now, as I stepped back into the shop, still tall and gleaming in its concrete block, but sure now of eminence. The doorbell in the alley was ringing again, more flowers. So it went for an hour, large bouquets and small ones, elaborate set pieces and homegrown plants and clay pots. For although the party was for the shop, the affection of the city was for father. Harlem's grand old man, they called him, and they were setting about to prove it. When the shop in the workroom would not hold another bouquet, Betsy and I started carrying them upstairs to the two rooms about the shop. Though it was twenty years since her death, these were still Tante John's rooms. Tante John's was mother's older sister, and her presence lingered in the massive dark furniture she had left behind her. Betsy set down a pot of greenhouse-grown tulips and stepped back with a little cry of pleasure. Corey, just look how much brighter! Poor Betsy. The bijou was so closed in by the houses around that the window plants that she started each spring never grew tall enough to bloom. At 7.45, Hans the Apprentice arrived, and at 8, Toos, our sales lady bookkeeper. Toos was a sour-faced, scowling individual whose ill temper had made it impossible for her to keep a job until ten years ago she had come to work for father. Father's gentle courtesy had disarmed and mellowed her, and though she would have died sooner than admit it, she loved him as fiercely as she disliked the rest of the world. We left Hans and Toos to answer the doorbell and went upstairs to get breakfast. Only three places at the table, I thought, as I set out the plates. The dining room is in the house at the rear, five steps higher than the shop but lower than Tante John's rooms. To me, this room with its single window looked into the alley, looking into the alley was the heart of the home, this table with a blanket thrown over it. It made me a tent or a pirate's cove when I was small. I'd done my homework here as a, a school child. Here, Mama read aloud from Dickens on winter evenings, while the coal whistled in the brick hearth and cast a red glow over the tile, proclaiming, Jesus is victor. We used only a corner of the table now, Father, Betsy, and I, but to me the rest of the family was always there. There was Mama's chair and the three aunts' places over there. Not only Tante John's, but Mama's other two sisters had also lived with us. Next to me had sat my other sister, Noli and Willem, the only boy in the family, there beside Father. Noli and Willem had had homes of their own many years now, and Mama and the aunts were dead. But I still seemed to see them there. Of course, their chairs hadn't stayed empty long. Father could never bear a house without children. And whenever he heard a child in need of a home, a new face would appear at the table. Somehow, out of his watch shop that, that never made money, he fed and dressed and cared for eleven more children after his own four were grown. And now these two had grown up and married or gone off to work. And so I laid three plates on the table. Betsy brought the coffee in from the tiny kitchen, which was little more than a closet off the dining room and took bread from the drawer in the sideboard. She was setting them on the table when we heard Father's step coming down from the staircase. He went a little slowly now on the winding stairs, but still as punctual as one of his own watches, he entered the dining room, as he had every morning since I could remember at 8.10. Father, I said, kissing him and savoring the aroma of cigars that always clung to his long beard. A sunny day for the party. Father's hair and beard were now as white as the best tablecloth. Betsy had laid up for this special day, had laid out for this special day. But his blue eyes behind the thick round spectacles were as mild and merry as ever, and he gazed from one of us to the other with frank delight. 
Corey, dear, my dear Betsy, how gay and lovely you both look. He bowed his head as he sat down, said the blessing over the bread, and then went on eagerly. Your mother, how she would have loved these new styles and seeing you both look so pretty. Betsy and I looked hard into our coffee to keep from laughing. These new styles were the despair of our young nieces. who were always trying to get us into brighter colors, shorter skirts, and lower necklines. But conservative though we were, it was true that Mama had never had anything even as bright as my deep maroon dress or Betsy's dark blue one. In Mama's day, married women and unmarried ones of a certain age wore black from the chin to the ground. I'd never seen Mama and the aunts in any other color. Wow, Mama would have loved everything about today, Betsy said. Remember how she loved occasions? Mama could have coffee on the stove and a cake in the oven as fast as most people could say best wishes. And since she knew almost everyone in Harlem, especially the poor, sick, and neglected, there was almost no day in the year that was not for somebody, as she would say with eyes shining, a very special occasion. And so we sat over coffee as one should on anniversaries and looked back, back to the time when Mama was alive and beyond, back to the time when Father was a small boy growing up in this same house. I was born right in this room, he said, as though he had not told us a hundred times. Only, of course, it wasn't the dining room then, but a bedroom, and the bed was in a kind of cupboard set into the wall with no windows and no air or light of any kind. I was the first baby who lived. I don't know how many there were before me, but they all died. Mother had tuberculosis, you see, and they didn't know about contaminated air or keeping babies away from sick people. It was a day for memories, a day for calling up the past. How could we have guessed as we sat there, two middle-aged spinsters and an old man, that in place of memories were about to be given adventures such as we'd never dreamed of? Adventure and anguish, horror and heaven were just around the corner and we did not know. Oh, Father, Betsy, if I had known, would I have gone ahead? Could I have done the things I did? But how could I know? How could I imagine this white-haired man called Opa, grandfather, by all the children of Harlem? How could I imagine this man thrown by strangers into a grave without a name? And Betsy, with her high lace collar and gift for making beauty all around her, how could I picture this dearest person on earth to me, this dearest person on earth to me, standing naked before a room full of men? In that room on that day, such thoughts were not even thinkable. Father stood up and took the big brass hinged Bible from its shelf as Tuus and Hans rapped on the door and came in. Scripture reading at eight thirty each morning for all who were in the house was another of the fixed points around which life in the Beji revolved. Father opened the big volume, and Betsy and I held our breaths. Surely today of all days, when there was still so much to do, it would not be a whole chapter. But he was turning to the Gospel of Luke, where we'd left off yesterday. Such long chapters in Luke, too. With his finger at the place, Father looked up. Where is Christoffels? he said. Christoffels was the third and only other employee in the shop, a bent, wizened little man who looked older than Father, though actually he was ten years younger. I remember the day six or seven years earlier, when he had first come into the shop, so ragged and woe-begone, that I assumed that he was one of the beggars who had the beji marked as a sure meal. I was about to send him up to the kitchen, when Betsy kept a, where Betsy kept a pot of soup simmering, when he announced with great dignity that he was considering permanent employment and was offering his services first to us. It turned out that Christoffels belonged to an almost vanished trade, the itinerant clockmender who trudged on foot throughout the land, regulating and repairing the tall pendulum clocks that were the pride of every Dutch farmhouse. But if I was surprised at the grand manner of this shabby little man, I was even more astonished when Father hired him on the spot. They're the finest clockmen anywhere, he told me later, these wandering clocksmiths. There's not a repair job they haven't handled with just the tools in their sack. And so it had proved through the years as people from all over Harlem brought their clocks to him. What he did with his wages we never knew. He had remained as tattered and threadbare as ever. Father hinted as much as he dared, for next to his shabbiness, Christoffel's most notable quality was his pride, and then gave it up. And now for the first time ever, Christoffel's was late. Father polished his glasses with his napkin and started to read, his deep voice lingering lovingly over the words. He had reached the bottom of the page when we heard Christoffel's shuffling steps on the stairs. The door opened and all of us gasped. Christoffel's was resplendent in a new black suit, new checkered vest, a snowy white shirt, flowered tie, and a stiff starched collar. I tore my eyes from the spectacle as, I, as swiftly as I could, for Christoffel's expression forbade us to notice anything out of the ordinary. Christoffel's, my dear associate, father murmured in his formal, form, formal old-fashioned way. What joy to see you on this auspicious day, and hastily he resumed his Bible reading. Before he reached the end of the chapter, the doorbells were ringing. 
both the shop bell in the street and the family bell in the alley. Betsy ran to make more coffee and put her tar tart juice in the oven, while Toos and I hurried to the doors. It seemed that everyone in Harlem wanted to be the first to shake Father's hand. Before long, a steady stream of guests were winding up the narrow staircase to Tante John's rooms, where he sat almost lost in a thicket of flowers. I was helping one of the older guests up the steep stairs when Betsy seized my arm. Corey, we're going to need Nolly's cup right away. How can we? I'll go get them. Her sister Nolly and her husband were coming that afternoon as soon as their six children got home from school. I dashed down the stairs, took my coat and my bicycle from inside the alley door, and was wheeling it over the threshold when Betsy's voice reached me, soft but firm. Corey, your new dress! So I whirled back up the stairs to my room, changed into my oldest skirt, and set out over the bumpy brick streets. I always loved to bike to Nolly's house. She and her husband lived about a mile and a half from the Beji, outside the cramped old center of the city. The streets were there were broader and straighter. Even the sky seemed bigger. Across the town square, I pedaled over the canal on the Grote Hout, Grot, Hout Bridge and along the Wigan Wag, reveling in the thin winter sunshine. Nolly lived on Bess and Ovenstraat. Bess and Ovenstraat, a block of identical attached houses with white curtains and potted plants in the windows. How could I foresee as I zipped around the corner that one summer day when the hyacinths in the commercial bulb flats nearby were ripe and brown? I would break my bicycle there and stand with my heart thudding in my throat, daring to go no closer for fear of what was taking place behind Nolly's starch curtains. Today I careened into the sidewalk and burst through the door. It was never a knock. Nolly, the beiges jammed already. You ought to see. We need the cups right now. Nolly came out of the kitchen, her round, pretty face flushed with baking. They're all packed by the door. Oh, I wish I could go back with you, but I've got batches of cookies still to bake, and I promised Flip and the children I'd wait for them. You're all coming, aren't you? Yes, Corey, Peter will be there. Nolly was loading the cups into the bicycle bags. As a dutiful aunt, I tried to love all my nieces and nephews equally, but Peter, well, was Peter. At thirteen, he was a musical prodigy and a rascal in the pride of my life. He's even written a special song in honor of the day, Nolly said. Here now, you'll have to carry this bag full in your hand, so be careful. The Beijing was more crowded than ever when I got back. The alley so jammed with bicycles that I had to leave mine at the corner. The mayor of Harlem was there in his tailcoat and gold watch chain, and the postman and the trolley motor man and half a dozen policemen from the Harlem police headquarters were just around the corner. After lunch, the children started coming, and as children always did, they went straight to father. The older ones sat on the floor around him. The smallest ones climbed into his lap. For in addition to his twinkling eyes and long cigar-sweet beard, father ticked. Watches lying on a shelf run differently from watches carried about, and so father always wore the ones he was regulating. His suit jackets had four huge inside pockets, each fitted with hooks for a dozen watches, so that wherever he went, a hum of a hundred... The hum of hundreds of little wheels went gaily with him. Now with the child on each knee and ten more crowded close, he drew from another pocket his heavy, cross-shaped winding key, each of the four ends shaped with a different size clock. With a flick of his finger, he made it spin, gleaming and glinting. Betsy stopped in the doorway with a tray of cakes. He doesn't know there's anyone else in the room, she said. I was carrying a stack of soiled plates down the stairs when a little shriek below told me that Pickwick had arrived. We used to forget who... We, we who loved him, what a shock the first sight of him could be to a stranger. I hurried down to the door, introduced him hastily to the wife of an Amsterdam wholesaler, and got him upstairs. He sank his ponderous bulk into a chair beside father, fixed one eye on me and the other on the ceiling, and said, Five lumps, please. Poor Pickwick. He loved children as much as father did, but while children took to father on sight, Pickwick had to win them. He had one trick, though, that never failed. I brought him his cup of coffee thick with sugar and watched him look around in mock consternation. But my dear Cornelia, he cried, there's no table to set it on. He glanced out of one wide-set eye to make sure the children were watching. Well, it's a lucky thing I brought my own. And with that, he set cup and saucer on his own protruding paunch. I'd never known a child who could resist it. Soon a respectful, a respectful circle had gathered round him. A little later, Noli and her family arrived. Tante Cory, Peter greeted me innocently. You don't look one hundred years old, and before I could swat him, he was sitting on Tante John's upright piano, filling the whole old house with melody. People called out requests, popular songs, selections from Bach chorales, hymns, and soon the whole room was joining in the choruses. How many of us were there that happy afternoon? We were soon to meet under very different circumstances. 
Peter, the policeman, dear ugly Pickwick, all of us were there except my brother Willem and his family. I wondered why they should be so late. Willem and his wife and children lived in the town of Hilversum, thirty miles away. Still, they should have been here by now. Suddenly the music stopped, and Peter, from his perch on the piano bench, hissed across the room, Opa, here's the competition. I glanced out the window. Turning into the alley were Mr. and Mrs. Kahn, owners of the other watch shop on the street. By Harlem standards, they were newcomers, having opened their store only in 1910, and so had been on the Bartle Joris Strat a mere 27 years. But since they sold a good many more watches than we did, I considered Peter's comment factual enough. Father, however, was distressed. Not competitors, Peter, he said. Reprovingly, colleagues. And lifting children quickly off his knees, he got up and hurried to the head of the stairs to greet Kahn's. Father treated Mr. Kahn's frequent visits to the shop below as social calls from a cherished friend. Can't you see what he's doing? I would rage after Mr. Kahn had gone. He's finding out how much we're charging so he can undersell us. Mr. Kahn's display window always featured in bold figure figures prices exactly five guilders below our own. My father's face would light up with a kind of pleased surprise, as, as it always did on those rare occasions when he thought about the business side of watchmaking. But, Corey, people will save money when they buy from him. And then he would always add, I wonder how he does it. Father was a, as innocent of business know-how as father had his father had been before him. He would work for days on a difficult repair problem and then forget to send a bill. The more rare and expensive a watch, the less he was able to think about it in terms of money. A man should pay for the privilege of working on such a watch, he would say. As for merchandising methods, for the last 80 years of the shop's history, a shutter, the shutters on the streets had been closed each evening promptly at six. It was not until I myself had come into the business 20 years ago that I had noticed the throngs of strollers crowding the narrow sidewalks each evening and had seen how the other stores kept their windows lighted and opened. When I pointed this out to Father, he was as delighted as though I had made a profound discovery. And if people see the watches, it might make them want to buy one. Corey, my dear, how very clever of you. Mr. Kahn was making his way toward me now, full of cake and compliments. Guilty for the jealous thoughts I harbored, I took advantage of the crowd and made my escape downstairs. The workroom and the shop were even more crowded with well-wishers than the upstairs rooms. Hans was passing cakes in the back room, as was Toos in the front, and wearing the nearest thing to a smile that, he per that her perpetually down-drawn lips would permit. As for Christoffel's, he had simply an astonish astonishingly expanded. It was impossible to recognize that stooped and shabby little man in the glorious figure at the door, greeting newcomers with a former welcome followed by a relentless tour of the shop. Quite obviously, it was the greatest day of his life. All through the short winter afternoon they kept coming, the people who counted themselves father's friends, young and old, poor and rich, scholarly gentlemen and illiterate servant girls, only to father did it seem that they were all alike. That was father's secret. Not that he overlooked the differences in, differences in people, that he didn't know. That was father's secret. Not that he overlooked the differences in people, that he didn't know they were there. And still, Willem was not there. I said goodbye to some of the guests at that door and stood for a moment, gazing up and down the Bartle drawer strut. Although it was only four in the afternoon, the lights in the shops were coming on against the January dusk. I still had a great deal of little sister worship for this big brother, five years older than I, an ordained minister, and the only ten boom who had ever been to college. Willem saw things I felt. He knew what was going on in the world. Oftentimes, indeed, I wished that Willem did not quite see so well, for much of what we, much of what he saw was frightening. A full ten years ago, way back in, in 1927, Willem had written in his doctoral thesis, done in Germany, that a terrible evil was taking root in that land. Right at the university, he said, seeds were being planted of a contempt for human life such as the world had never seen. The few who had read his paper had laughed. No, of course, well, people weren't laughing about Germany. Most of the good clocks came from there. And recently, several firms with whom we had dealt for years were simply and mysteriously out of business. Willem believed it was part of a deliberate and large-scale move against Jews. Every one of the closed businesses was Jewish. As head of the Dutch Reformed Church's program to reach Jews, Willem kept in touch with these things. Dear Willem, I thought, as I stepped back inside and closed the door, he was about as good a salesman of the church as father was of watches. If he'd converted a single Jew in twenty years, I hadn't heard about it. Willem didn't try to change people, just to serve them. He had scrimped and saved enough money to build a home for elderly Jews in Hilversum, for the elderly of all faiths, in fact, for Willem was against any system of segregation. But in the last few months... 
the home had been deluged with younger arrivals all jews and all from germany willem and his family had given up their own living quarters and were sleeping in a corridor and still the frightened homeless people kept coming and with them tales of mounting madness i went up to the kitchen where nolly would just brewed a fresh pot of coffee picked it up and continued with it upstairs to tante john's rooms what does he want i asked a group of men gathered around the keg table as i sat down the pot this man in germany does he want war i knew it was poor talk for a party but somehow thoughts of willem had always set my mind on hard subjects a chill of silence fell over the table and spread swiftly around the room what does it matter a voice broke into it let the big countries fight it out it won't affect us that's right from a watch salesman the germans let us alone in the great war it's to their advantage to keep us neutral easy for you to talk cried a man from whom we bought we bought clock parts your stock comes from switzerland what about us what do i do if germany goes to war a war could put me out of business and at that moment willem entered the room behind him came tiny his wife and their four children but every eye in the room had settled on the figure whose arm willem held in his it was a jew in his early thirties in a typical broad-brimmed black hat and long black coat what glued every eye to this man was his face it had been burned in front of his right ear dangled a gray and frazzled ringlet like the hair of a very old man the rest of his beard was gone leaving only a raw and gaping wound this is herr goldlieber willem announced in german he had just arrived in hilversum this morning herr goldlieber my father he got out of germany on a milk truck willem told us rapidly in dutch they stopped him on a street corner teenage boys in munich set fire to his beard father had risen from his chair and was eagerly shaking the newcomer's hand i brought him a cup of coffee coffee and a plate of noli's cookies how grateful i was 